we're at a very interesting place. We just injected some algebra into our study. So previously, before we introduced geometric vectors, all we had was pure geometry. Once again, very pretty, but requires ingenuity. And what we didn't have is addition and multiplication by numbers. Now that we introduced vectors, geometric vectors, we're actually in a very interesting place. We still don't have coordinates, so we have not reduced the geometric problem to numbers, where you start with a problem, impose a coordinate system upon the space, translate everything into coordinates, now you just have tables of numbers, and you figure out ways of manipulating those numbers. That's actually ultimately where we're going, but right now we're at a place that's in between, that's actually quite appealing. We don't have coordinates, so we're still dealing with real objects. But what we can now do, what we now have is objects that we can add and we can multiply by numbers. That's a big deal. Because what we have brought to the equation, what we have brought to the party now, is our algebraic intuition. And it's tremendous. You spend most of your mathematical careers in the world of algebra, developing your algebraic intuition, not your geometric intuition. Your algebra is very, very strong. The algebra that we'll engage in, by your standards, will be very, very simple. Now, it might get a little messy, but messiness does not mean complexity. From the complexity point of view, it'll remain very, very simple, just linear, linear equations. Maybe occasionally a quadratic, but I don't necessarily think so. Okay? So, we have brought our algebraic intuition, and we'll now be solving problems not with our geometric ingenuity, which is fun if you enjoy that sort of thing, but really challenging, uh, with algebraic intuition, which is completely straightforward. So it's this straightforwardness that we'll be going for today. And we just have to learn to speak the language of vectors and dot products. So let's practice that a little bit in just two tiny examples. So, for example, in normal speech, we would say two vectors, u and v, are orthogonal. Now, how would you say it in terms of the concepts that we introduced in the last lecture? That's right, u dot v equals zero. So, it's kind of knowing the definition of the dot product. It seems like an idle exercise, so I said it differently. But it's not an idle exercise. You're doing something very valuable. You're beginning to see how to express everything in terms of the dot product. And we have so few elements to work with. Addition, multiplication by numbers, and the dot product. Those are, those are the only elements that we have that the instinct that you'll develop is where whatever problem you have, you'll just translate it in terms of those quantities and concepts, and off you go with your algebra. Okay, how would you say this would not be accurate on, for this picture, that the length of u is the same as the length of v. Yeah, that's right. Or you would just say u dot u equals v dot v. Say the exact same thing, you just save the trouble of saying the square root, right? Because comparing length squared is the same as comparing lengths. Okay, so this was two trivial examples, nearly trivial examples, or maybe a mathematician would say tautological, but it's indicative of how things go. You just start expressing everything, it's like learning a language, in terms of these elements. So let's look at just a couple. Let's look at an equation of a straight line. What's a straight line? A straight line is specified by a point that it goes through and the direction that it goes in. That's one way to specify a straight line. Another would be a straight line that goes through two points, or a straight line that goes through a given point orthogonal to another line. There are different ways. But let's focus on this one. So, uh, we will always start with an arbitrary origin. And we will capture this particular point that's given with a vector. Okay, so we'll call it vector A. And maybe the direction will be specified by a vector D. Okay? And then we'll need a parameter. So here come numbers. A parameter is sort of like a coordinate. It is a coordinate. Even though, even if I'm pretending that it's not. And then I will just say A plus TD. And that's a parametric specification for this line. It will describe 
uh, an infinitude of vectors that all start at the origin O, and their tips keep landing on this line. That's easy to see. When t is 0, we're right here, right? When t is 1, we're right here. When t is 2, we're right here. When t is 3, and so on. When t is minus 1, we're here. And you can see that it works. Okay. So that's another, maybe slightly less trivial example. Right? We have a geometric concept, a straight line that passes through a given point in a given direction. Right? And we've submitted it to our, if I may call it, algebraic framework, quite simply, right? And you already know this will ring a bell, that there is great arbitrariness in here, contained in this expression, because I could have taken any vector, my vector A could be any vector whose tip lies on the line, right? So this representation is not unique. That's what I'm trying to say. This representation is not unique. I could have chosen any point uh, to be the tip of my vector A, and I could have chosen any vector that points in this or the opposite sense, as long as it's not a zero vector, along the line. So doesn't this kind of look like a general solution to a linear system? Remember there was a particular solution that was arbitrary as long as it satisfied the equation. And then any vector from the null space, and the null space was a span of its basis vectors. So it's the exact same algebraic structure. So in fact, you can imagine the solution, the, the geometric interpretation of solving a linear system is finding either a line or a plane that doesn't pass through the center. You know. And you can see the arbitrariness, so I can kind of manipulate this algebraically for example, I like doing this. It helps me understand the arbitrariness, non-uniqueness contained in this expression. So for example, I can steal 1D from here and just write it as A plus A plus D. And to compensate for it, I will write T minus 1D. Do you see how I kind of stole D from here and put it here? And now I can think of this as my starting vector, and this is the new as a new parameter alpha. You know, and if this is my new starting vector, well then it points over here, right? And so on, and so, and this is my new parameter, alpha. So when alpha is zero, I'm now here. And, you know, I reparameterize the curve. And you can see that familiar, familiar, pattern from solving linear systems where you can steal a vector from the null space and add it to a particular solution and get another particular solution. And so on. So that's kind of nice. So we've got straight lines. We're going to use that today quite a bit. Here is a good example. Let's now talk about a straight line or maybe a segment that passes through two points, A and B. How we're going to describe that. I'll show you two ways. One that treats them unequally, and another way that treats them equally. So I'm about to discuss this, but I just want to point out, because it's just so striking, just how ridiculously simple algebra is, right? On the one hand, I think I can call this, what we're doing is relatively sophisticated. The sophistication here is answering the questions, why are we doing this? Where is this going? How is this going to help us? What are the applications? Are, the, uh, are you using properties rigorously? And so on. So there's a lot of sophistication. But there is not, but it doesn't go into the algebraic complexity. Algebraic complexity is as simple as, I'm going to guess, fifth grade. Okay, so again, arbitrary origin. I'm no longer going to mark it with the letter O, because it's, we're, never ref, we're never really reference it. Just everything starts here, but that's its own. Role. And so here is A, and I will call this B, okay? So one way to specify the line is to just fall back on what we discovered here. And we would write this line. Should I even, could I have, should I have written something like this? I think maybe I should have. L of T 
equals where L is the vector traveling along the line. I think that's good when you give a name to the expression you're writing. Okay, so falling back on what we did before, L of t line equals, well, we'll start with a, and then we know what d equals, the vector that specifies the direction of the line. That's just b minus a. That's still my favorite operation with vectors, subtracting two vectors, subtracting one vector from another, because you just get to connect the tips. And when you need to connect the tips, you know that you need to subtract. And so it goes both ways. So here is b minus a, so I will say plus t times b minus a. Let's explore this just a little bit. When t is zero, we're right at a. When t is one, we're right at b. So that's the scale of our parameter. That's really, uh, it's a coordinate, but I'm not gonna call it that. It's a coordinate on the straight line, but let's call it a parameter. And this could be called a parameterization of the straight line. Okay, this makes sense? Okay, but let's give it a little bit more symmetry. symmetry. We're treating A and B unequally, so let's now treat it equally. And let's collect like terms, and we will have... Yeah, so that's nice. This treats uh, A and B equally. It's some coefficient times A plus some coefficient times B. And maybe just for even greater symmetry, I would like to call this alpha. And so I'm going to write this as alpha A plus beta B. So what I screwed up is that it doesn't, you don't see the parameter T anymore, right? So it's really here, I should have stopped. But this is very appealing. And let me just answer the following question for you. Uh, what should be true of alpha and beta for this vector expressed by this linear combination to lie on the straight line connecting A and B? So you, when you see alpha A plus beta B, the most generic of all linear combinations, by looking at alpha and beta, for example, if it was uh, 3A minus B, does that lie on the line connecting A and B? What needs to be true of alpha and beta for the result of this linear combination to lie on the straight line connecting A and B? Yeah, they need to add up to one, just like you see right here, right? That's really all it is. They just need to add up to one, okay? So I like analyzing this expression, playing around with it a little bit. So let's see where we land depending on the values that we take. So if alpha equals, if alpha is one and beta is zero, where are we? Right at A, right? And when alpha equals zero and beta equals one, where are we? Right at B, good. What about when alpha equals one half and beta equals one half, where are we? exactly halfway in between, even though it's not at all obvious, right? So if you wanted to make sense of that from the tip to tail rule, right, that's not at all easy to see, but it would be like this. You would go halfway up A and then half, you know, half of B. And you see you're, you have to sort of invoke that mid-segment mid theorem to justify that you land right in the middle, but it's exactly true. So I'll, I'll actually write it. So this is, so I won't draw the vector because that will make things messy, but it'll end right here. And that's actually very nice from the intuitive point of view because the average of A and B actually falls at the geometrically average location, in the mean location. That's kind of nice for intuition. And if I take, let's say, so listen because I'm not gonna write it, three quarters of A and one quarter of B, then I will be exactly right here, right? Three quarters, so there's more of A than B, so you're closer to A than B. 
So I'm glad a couple of you went. Is that true? It's, is, it the op is it not the opposite way? Yeah, that's right. It's not the opposite way. So if you take the weight of A to be three times more than what the weight of B is, so three quarters A and one quarter B, then the distance to A will be one third of what it is to B. So there's that inverse. Does that make sense? So if I take seven eighths of A and one eighth of B, I will be right here, eight times closer to A than to B. Actually, seven, because it'll be in proportion one to seven. Overall, one plus seven equals eight, but this will be one eighth and the rest will be seven eighths. And so the proportion will be one to seven. Inverse of how the weights are related. Makes sense. The more you put on A, the closer you are to A, and so on. Okay, so that's nice. Uh, this will actually come up with one of the problems that I'd like to show you. So I think we should solve some problems, yes? Let's solve some problems.